I want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Sharon Farb. I am the Associate University Librarian for Collection Management and Scholarly Communication here at the UCLA Library. Um, so let me first uh, thank the co-sponsors who without them um, this would not have been possible. So uh, our sincere thanks an ongoing collaboration with the following groups who I'm going to name. So the American Indian Studies Center, the Department of Anthropology, Women's Studies, World Arts and Cultures, the Cesar Chavez Department of Chicana Chicano Studies, the Latin American Institute, um, and also a special thanks to Gloria Chacon, who is the inspiration behind this series, who is a person who's working and been working with the library for the past two years and is in a new role this year who is our Mesoamerican librarian specialist and who will be um, worldwide collecting ephemera related to the areas that she's focused on. So thank you all and all of the sponsors for time. So uh, Jessica Catalino is, the, is an associate professor in the anthropology department here at UCLA. Uh, her book, High Stakes, Florida Seminole Gaming and Sovereignty, was published by Duke University Press in 2008. Uh, it was awarded the Delmas Jones and Jagna Sharif Memorial Book Prize from the Society of Anthropology of North America and also received an honorable mention for the Gregory Batson Book Prize and the Society for Cultural Anthropology. Um, Jessica's work, has she's widely published. So all you have to do if you're interested, I was interested, is go to her web page and you'll see a long list of, of publications related to the topics of her uh, focus. And those are cultur cultural anthropology, uh, sociocultural anthropology, citizenship, sovereignty, um, the colonialism, economy, gender, the environment, Indian gaming, and the Native North American. So without further ado, let me have Jessica come up, say a few words about David. Uh, then David will speak, then we'll have some uh, little discussion, intro of a discussion, and then some Q&A. Um, okay, and, and I think we should play a game to see how many times we can introduce. Um, <laughs> so my job is to now introduce David. Um, and we'll see who David introduces us to. Um, David Delgado Shorter is an associate professor in world arts and culture here at UCLA after earning his PhD in 2002 from the History of Consciousness program at UC Santa Cruz. Um, he is, I think it's safe to say, uh, trained across the disciplines. Um, we like to claim him as an anthropologist. I'm sure other people like to claim him as other things as well. He has an MA in religious studies from Arizona State. In, from 1996 and did his undergraduate work also in religious studies and gender studies. Um, so it's been interdisciplinary all along. Prior to coming to UCLA, David was assistant professor of folklore and ethnomusicology. So he tries to get as many different disciplines and names um, <laughs> onto his CV um, at Indiana University in Bloomington in a wonderful department that's um, just gotten all kinds of recognition. So we're very lucky to have him coming from that department to us. Prior to that intern, he was a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Wesleyan and their really interesting program um, on the Americas there. And one of the distinctive things about David's CV is that in addition to more conventional academic publications, he's done a lot of scholarly academic work in other media. In particular, I'd urge you all to check out his um, website, which you can find the links for um, from, his, from his web page, his faculty web page, um, which is a, a publication of note and scale and scope um, on, on some of the material that he'll be talking about today. He's also um, working on maybe just about finishing an online UMA English dictionary. Um, so we can kind of add linguist to the, um, the stack here. Um, and he's currently editing a book series with the University of Nebraska Press on um, indigenous films. 
And these will be uh, books that are useful for teaching um, a lot as companion books with films. So not only is he working himself in multiple media, but he's also working to promote multiple media um, in the way we, we think and talk to each other um, in the academy and beyond. And so today we're going to hear from, um, in some ways, a conventional medium, the book. Um, but I think David will also lead us through some of the ways in which it's a less conventional um, piece of work as an ethnography. And so today we hear David read from and then talk about We Will Dance Our Truth, Yaki History and Weme Performances by David Delgado Shorter. Thank you very much for coming out today. It's hard in LA to go anywhere and do anything sometimes it feels like. So just knowing how busy you are and taking a little time out to sit and talk about books feels good. It feels good and right. And um, any time an anthropologist talks about their work, uh, particularly inside an academic setting, it's about bringing the work somewhere present. And that work is only possible for who's absent. And so I start off by saying that none of this is possible. I don't have a podium to stand behind if it wasn't for the people that I work with, including the elders who originally approved for me to work inside their Pueblo. Um, if you open up um, the book, when you first see it, you'll see that there's two images there, um, Antonio Buitamea and um, uh, my compai, which means he's the person who first brought me into the ceremonial system, um, Ignacio Sombra. They've both passed away since the time I was doing my um, research. So this last June, I took the book back to the Pueblo for the first time and I gave it to their kids and showed them the images that I put of their parents. They didn't know I was gonna put images of their parents there um, as the dedication. Um, and so I start by recognizing them because none of it would have happened had it not been for them and they don't get to be in these spaces. We get to have fruit and we get to sit and talk in air conditioned room. And so I acknowledge their absence today before I start anything else. Just to let you know, these images are from 18 years of fieldwork. They have no relationship to what I'm talking there, only to give you a better texture of the place where I work. They're almost all from Potam Pueblo, which is one of the eight Pueblos on the Mexican side of the US-Mexican border. Um, the Yoame call themselves also Yaqui, and they're mostly known by Yaquis outside, so I'll often use the words interchangeably. This is the Hiaquim, which means their territory, and you'll see here language schools, which are like boarding schools, domicilios, and um, you'll see some of the eight Pueblos, even though they've now been kicked out of those Pueblos by Mexicans and those cities have been taken over by other people, we still imagine them as being Yoame territory and Yoame property, so you'll see images of that. Um, almost all slides, which I work primarily in slide, 35 millimeter slide, gets turned into a darker form once you digitize it and then put it on a large LED. So some of it's a little hard to see, but hopefully you can recognize uh, parts of those images. Uh, one of the things that was the hardest about writing this book is, is that I was trained during the uh, writing culture debates. Um, so after I had entered graduate school in 93, so by that point we had already started deconstructing the two notions of authenticity and authority. And so it became really difficult to imagine doing a project in which you had ethnographic authority and we're talking about authentic culture while reading in graduate school how you have none and it's all constructed and you're not supposed to claim it and if you do you're being colonist so so it was like one of these things where i didn't want to be a colonist and i at the same time wanted to keep doing this work and i thought there was some value work valuable work to be doing i also wanted to write an ethnography that wasn't about that debate because then you're just using your the the family members who brought you into their culture to play out an academic theory or to play some sort of theory game and in order to write a book that was solely about the UMA, it meant taking all that I was learning about what makes a good ethnography, but don't say any of what makes it a good ethnography, or don't play out those debates, because then it's less about the people you're supposed to be working with. So the result is, is that you have a book which has, at the end of every chapter, direct transcripts from field notes, where you can see where the data comes from that I'm pulling from for the interpretation that's inside the chapter before it. However, I don't always agree with that data. And so what it ends up showing is that there's these chasms between what we actually learn in here and what we put into writing because we do have to claim authority. We are the ones who have the training, the graduate training. We're privileged to do this and to not exercise that would actually be a disservice as well. The other thing that I did is I decided that so much of what counts as academic language is really not how we learn. We learn through much more personal means. And so I had to find a way in which I could 
input into the text this personal learning that I felt was just as viable, valuable and viable as other ways of learning. So seemingly randomly, but of course not, because it's all constructed, I, ha I go into personal voice and create that is italicized. Now, as you can imagine, anyone who's published a book, each one of these is an argument you have to have with the press. Because they don't want, they would not publish a book without the word yaki in it, for example. Because they're known as the yaki. So if I use their new term that they call themselves, supposedly, no one would know to buy the book and link it to Carlos Castaneda and the millions of dollars he made misrepresenting the yaki. So you sort of have to have these give and takes throughout the process. I'm happy to say that thanks to the University of Nebraska Press and Matt Bakovoy, my acquisitions editor, he let me or we agreed on a lot. And one of the things that we agreed on is this personal voice so that the reader, particularly the reader from the tribe, from the community or from tribal communities in general, didn't feel like we were using a private language that's class-based and based inside the academic language that we often use for scholarship. Um, that personal voice is what I will read from because I think reading academic voice is odd. Um, so uh, I, want to I want to start by saying how some of this voice looks and by giving you an excerpt that comes from the very last chapter because none of the excerpts um, grow chronologically, which is one of the other things about writing is our aha moments, the ways we learn aren't often chronological themselves. So I say in the last chapter, Arriving in Potam this afternoon, Felipe drove us directly to the church plaza. Usually, we come straight to my compai's house to meet the family. Felipe said that we should first visit my compai, who had recently passed away. And this is the woman who the book's dedicated to. At the church, we got out of the jeep and walked to the great cross, where we moved our hats, genuflected, and crossed ourselves. We then began searching for her grave. The Potam ceremony, approximately 30 yards square, is filled with small painted crosses, all the same hue of light blue. Since the graves are shallow, each has a mound of hardened mud creating an elongated dome shape. There are no boundaries marked between the graves, and so you have to step carefully in the 10 inches or less of space between the mounds. And at times, I actually have to pause and balance myself so as not to step too close to a cross or some soiled plastic flowers or the weathered remains of a crepe paper wreath. Some of the small crosses have names written in black ink or paint on one of their horizontal arms, but most do not. I figured my Komai would not have had one of the large concrete tombstones since her family always seems to be struggling for money. Felipe was leading us this afternoon, and I saw him stop at one cross and motion to me he had found her. He removed his hat, and when I reached her small mound, I removed mine. I looked down, and I saw the hand-painted cross with her name, Antonia Flores Buitamea, 3rd of June, 1929. I didn't know what to do with myself or my thoughts. I personally don't associate the mounds of dirt with where deceased now reside. I, um, I stood in repose. I figured I should stay there and stare downward. I stood there thinking, it's sad. She's not around anymore. She was always so nice to me, even in my first trips. She only had one leg, and one of her hands was deformed. She was bedridden, but she seemed to micromanage the entire family from that spot. Since my first trips entailed a lot of me just sitting around while everyone went about their business, I often sat with her in the cool darkness of her mud-thatched cane room, an oscillating fan rotating back and forth across me. I would ask her questions in Spanish, and then she would answer so sweetly, her voice light, a little scratchy. And then she would yell as loud as possible for someone to bring us food or something, and one of her adult children would move swiftly to meet her request. Often, since I didn't want to be too noisy, nosy during my first visits, and because she seemed to lose energy quickly, I would just sit in silence with her. She would point to things or animals and say their names in Yoeme, and I would try to repeat what she said, and then she would repeat it to be sure. And there were small exchanges with a lot of silence in between. So I would point to the puppy lying in the sun, the rooster picking through the ashes, or the large clay water pot dripping slow drops onto the earth. Il chu'u, tuioia, vaachia. At her gravesite, I thought about these things. And I grew happy that I had known her. I thought of all the things she had seen in her life and how I probably wouldn't have ever been invited back had she not approved. I caught myself expressing my gratitude in my thoughts to her, but I didn't actually think of her there. I've never visited cemeteries regularly because I've never lived where my family was buried. 
When I left New Mexico to attend college, I moved away from the graves of my ancestors. I hadn't thought that I was lacking a space for communication with my deceased loved ones. I found myself today in one of those moments of cultural difference. What does it mean to walk by the graves of your departed ancestors every day? Would it change how I thought of my community if every death required a production, particularly if I lived in a household with three generations of family members? There'd be weekly skyrockets, bell ringings, 10 godparents, church groups, dancers, processions to the ceremony, a party nine days later, a year of mourning, a celebration to the end of the year of mourning, a month in which the departed return every October. The constant living while engaged with dying. How do we begin to understand ourselves as always in active, responsible relationships with the dead among us? As I sit here in my home, away from home, I'm beginning to realize that we're not just sharing time together as I do field work, but to realize that I'm also starting to build friendships with their departed loved ones. As I come to help with the anima miqua ceremonies, the feeding of the dead, I'm feeding the dead. As I walk in the processions, I'm bodily asserting myself into a collective reconstitution of a distinctly Yoeme social order and ethic. We crossed ourselves at the foot of my Komai's gravesite and we put our hats back on as we walked toward the Jeep. An old Yoeme man sitting by the door of the church tipped his hat to us and we offered our respective Leo Samchania back to him. We got into the Jeep and we drove to my Komai's house. With the joy we have come to expect at these arrivals, the family told us that it was good to see us as we walked through the yard touching hands. I didn't see Ignacio, this is Guillermo's father and Antonia's husband, and I asked where he was. He's lying in his room. Well, I asked if I could see him, and Guillermo showed Felipe and me into the house. Fully dressed, covered in several blankets, Ignacio rolled over slightly to offer his hand. He looked frailer than I'd ever seen him, although he did manage a smile for us. Walking outside, we looked at Guillermo, his son, and he responded in Yoeme that his father was still mourning and that he spends his days in bed. We all fell silent, and I felt heartbroken. This was my first visit here without the oldest wife and the mother of the family being alive. Changing the mood, Guillermo remarked that he knew we were coming because a little bird had told him a couple days beforehand. I responded that his mother always heard similar messages from birds about our arrivals. He responded, we should go later to visit her in the cemetery. And Felipe told him that we had just come from there. And Guillermo looked simultaneously a bit sad and a bit happy. I'm sure he was missing her, but touched that we would pay her the visit first thing upon arrival. So in that excerpt, which is actually about a chapter about the ceremonies that people do for the deceased relatives, I'm attempting to assert the cultural difference of me not having that relationship with my ancestors. And I'm raising the ethnographic question, what's it mean for me to take on ancestral care in a community that's not my own? I start with this because it talks about the people who originally said yes, but it's also October. October is the month that the dead come back and visit us all month long, from October 1st to November 7th. And they show up in the form of um, ants, or they show up in the form of white dogs that don't seem to have an owner. Um, they also show up in the form of themselves or in unseen presences. Um, and they're watching and they're just checking in. There's not a moral implication that they're seeing if you're bad or good or anything like that. They just get to come back. It's like a free pass from wherever they're at for the month of October. And I thought it would be appropriate to start there because it's October and um, it's when I miss the Pueblo the most. Um, there's a way that I don't know if any or if many contemporary Americans live that are constantly in care of their ancestors in the way in which being in this community forced me to be. Um, it was also an opportunity for me to take something that they do and put it in the book and not use it as some sort of authorizing look how they're right or I'm right. It was just cultural difference and it sort of supports what um, Johannes Fabian says, a right to otherness. We shouldn't have to try to make sense and then assimilate all knowledge. There is a right to just simply being other and that's another way of living that I found interesting and sort of one of those things where I don't necessarily need to do it in my own life. I just enjoy doing it when I'm there. There are other points in the book where the italicized um, personal stories actually contradict what I put right around them. And I still left them in because I thought that if anything, it would highlight the fact that authority is a shared process. I might defer to them because they know about their culture and I don't, but I'm still the author. 
and I still have to make choices. And so in some ways what I'm doing is I'm accentuating that all of this is a choice. Even when I think I'm giving them authority, it's me who gives it to them because I'm the person who wrote the book. So if you listen to how I transition from the italicized area, and this is a slightly shorter excerpt, and then go into the academic language, which I'll just continue to do, you can see the contradiction. So it was shortly after meeting Felipe in 1993, I asked him if he would look over some of my college research papers that I had written on UMA history and worldview. Although he was very busy at the time, working with several linguists, ethnobotanists, and a children's deer singing group, he said he would look at them when he had the time. Back then, I, I would only see him once or twice a month when I drove down from Tempe to work in the Arizona State Museum in Tucson. Mostly, we would go to Marana Pueblo and meet. We'd have lunch in town or talk with elders from one of the other UMA communities. One of the privileges at that point of my life was being able to devote so much time to reading books. And I combined trips to the archives with opportunities to meet Felipe and discuss the archival material. I would work in cold piles of yellowing paper from morning until lunch and then meet Felipe to discuss what I had found. And then I would go back through the afternoon and then meet Felipe again to discuss what was in the state's museum collections. He was hearing from me about what the museum held pertaining to his cultures. I was learning how to think about those materials from his perspective by constantly being engaging in conversation through the reading process. We did this for years while also taking trips to the Pueblos in Mexico, thereby joining my archival work with contemporary ethnography. On one of my trips to Tucson, I met Felipe at La Indita for lunch, the best Mexican food in Tucson, and I was surprised to see him waiting with a folded stack of papers. There were my essays. He had read them and made notes all over them. Although he hadn't said anything previously, I just assumed he wouldn't take the time with all that he had to do. Plus, I had been warned by my professors that most community members simply don't have the luxury of time to sit around making the implicit explicit for outsiders. Now my three essays, all written for college courses, were covered in red ink. Wrong, not true, almost, and stuff like this. I was so grateful for his editorial comments that I actually didn't care. They were mostly negative at this point. <laughs> Now, since each paper was written for a different professor, the introductory section of each paper included a short history of the tribe. These were mostly summaries of first contact, the Spanish era, Jesuit era, the Mexican era, the diaspora, the resettlement. At that time, there wasn't a casino area to write about. <laughs> Over lunch, we flipped through the first paper so that he could read the comments and discuss what he and his partner, Herminia Valenzuela, had to say about my writing. During the review of the first paper, I noticed that he had skipped over one of his comments in the margins that read, let's discuss exclamation point. It was written next to a paragraph about the first conflict with the OMA army in 1533. We looked at the second paper and then he had written the same comment next to a paragraph discussing the same encounter. In the third paper, again, to the side of the paragraph about the Spanish first contact, Felipe had drawn some exclamation marks in red. By the time we finished reviewing the last paper, we had eaten our food and our plates had been cleared. As the waiter placed our coffee in front of us, Felipe said, I want to talk to you about the Yoeme Spanish battles. I remember the coffee tasting bitter and strong as I sat listening to him. Perhaps it was the first thing written about the Yoeme by the Europeans. Perhaps not. Perhaps the story of that battle is repeated by every historian. Even newspaper articles start their articles about the UMM and their fighting capabilities against the Spanish. And now, David, we have kids running around in gangs thinking that this warrior mentality is a good thing. They justify shooting and violence by saying they're fighters by blood. Felipe sounded exasperated by the information he was conveying. I let a few seconds pass while I digested his message. Felipe, I said, I want to be sure I understand what you're saying. Are you asking me to not write about that part of the tribe's history? Because I think these are exactly the sort of histories that should be told. Histories of resistance and strength. These are the rare moments in the history when the Indians are winning. It's like one of the best things about UMA history. You beat the Spanish in four or five consecutive battles. And that story of the old man drawing a line on the ground with all those animals around him in fighting formation, that's one of the best images of cultural contact I've ever heard. After being so happy that Felipe had critiqued my writing, I actually surprised myself by contesting one of his opinions. See, I wanted to assure him that I was receptive to different ideas. So I backed off a little. So do you think the Spanish were lying or creating some romantic notion of what the Yoame people were like? 
Oh no, he said. I like to imagine that encounter as much as you do. But all that language about being the fiercest fighters in the new world, who does it serve? Do we want our children proud of that quality instead of others? It clicked. I heard what he was saying. Something about his choice of words resonated for years. How do histories serve living people, particularly those historical images we think are inspiring? The braves, the chiefs, the warriors, the fighting Indians, they are all struggling against someone. These are counter positions, opposite of another fighter who might then elicit empathy or sympathy. Or perhaps we prefer the cloaked old man communicating with animals and standing alone in this epic ethnic and nationalist duel for access to undiscovered lands and the riches of gold supposedly lining the walls and paths of the Pueblos. What is the solution, Felipe? I think these stories of colonial resistance are important so that we don't continue seeing all native people in America as powerless and conquered. He replied, I think it would be better if you at least stopped repeating the fiercest fighter comment that the Spaniards may have written. Otherwise, we'll keep having kids think they are those fierce fighters, driving around and fighting with Mexicans and other groups as if they're living in another century. I agreed that I didn't want that to happen, and I thanked him for reading my papers, and I asked him to thank Herminia as well. Chocue tu asia, Felipe. Your opinions mean a lot to me. Felipe smiled and a bit humbly said, well, I'm just UMA talking, one UMA talking. While the details are limited in the written accounts of that first battle with Guzman and his expedition, both Spicer and Hudehart note that the Spanish were seriously rooted. Spicer mentions that the Yoame showed the greatest fighting ability of any native of New Spain. And then he moves on to describe Yoame settlement patterns, population, food sources, and so on. Hudehart, the committed archivist, contributes greater detail to this portrait of Guzman's expedition. So I actually do what I told him I understood the importance of not doing. I didn't put in the fiercest fighters, and the point here is not that I followed his direction or that I followed my direction, but that I gave the reader both. I have actually showed the debate, which is doing something um, Dwight Conker Good argues is the turn in anthropology that we should see in ethnography, which is that if we focus on the dialogue of the anthropological enterprise, it's actually more valid for both communities to reflect on that process than anything called a final interpretation or hermeneutic solution that he says happens. Um, I think one of the things that I also wanted to achieve, and this is the last part I wanted to emphasize in my reading today, and this is the last time I did the book reading like this, I was inside the tribal council chambers. And I didn't spend as much time talking about what the book is doing in some meta discursive way. I just read some of the excerpts and we talked about the pictures because I had the privilege of going to their homeland so many times that so many kids in the audience, they, they brought the high school and elementary school kids to the tribal councils to hear my presentation. They actually haven't seen many of these images from their own um, ancestral homeland. So we didn't talk that much about the book, so I hope you indulge me one more. This is the last one I'll read, and it shows what I was trying to do, which is show the, um, the way in which Native people are simultaneously linked in contemporary writing by um, an overly focus on the politics of their existence, um, when in fact some of them aren't political and they don't want to be political. They actually don't want to deal with politicians, and they prefer me not work with politicians. They'll only work with me if I don't get political approval, those sort of attitudes. And yet at the same time, the way in which sometimes those conversations um, elude the realities of racism that are still in place. And I wanted to just write one thing to get at that, and so I put this inside um, chapter three. Wanting to get away from the children in the Pueblo, Guillermo and I take a drive into a neighboring Mexican city for a bite to eat. Traveling with him through cities across Sonora is always an interesting experience, since I can see how neighboring communities react to my UMA companions. Now, since I'm not from Mexico, I often find myself on a learning curve about indigenous Mexican race relations. When last year we were walking down a sidewalk near a market in Obregón, a Mexican man intentionally bumped into Guillermo, and instead of saying, excuse me, he said, pinche indio, which means fucking Indian. Just last week, when telling a food server in another city that I was in the area working with the Yome, he responded matter-of-factly, there aren't any real yaquis anymore just those lazy fake Indians down by the river. I think about these moments while walking into a beachfront tourist bar in San Carlos, wearing my tennis shoes, jeans, shirt, glasses, and I see the waitress look at Guillermo's homemade sandals, his dirty cotton pants, 
his cowboy hat. She leads us to our seats and she gives us a few moments and she comes back in to take our order. What can I get you? She asks me. I order nachos. She writes down on a small pad of paper and then she asks me, and for him? Now, not immediately recognizing the dynamic, I ask Guillermo what he wants to eat. And he says in Spanish, I'll have a hamburger. She jots something down and then she says to me, does he want fries? Guillermo answers, yes, and coffee. She writes down something and tells me she'll be right back. Not once looking or directly addressing Guillermo. I look at him, he looks at me, and we're left half smiling at the situation. After eating, we drive around the boat harbor of San Carlos. Heading north, we see the large mountains of Taca Lime. Known as Tetecawe by most of the locals and tourists, Taca Lime is the northernmost peak of the Sierra Madre Occidental mountain range, and it towers over both the towns of San Carlos and the Sonora Bay. The mountain, the bay, and the beaches contribute to a south-of-the-border paradise for retirees and partygoers across northern Sonora and the southwestern U.S. Only 250 miles south of Arizona, a well-maintained highway connects San Carlos to the large state universities of Arizona and Mazatlan, Guadalajara, Mexico City. As Guillermo and I drive around the marina to the base of Takalime, we're conscious that this tourist destination is built on historically Yoame homelands. Takalime is not solely considered the most northern point of Aboriginal Yoame territory. The mountain plays a major role in traditional and contemporary Yoame worldview. I park on a small path that runs across the base of the mountain and we get out to walk. The sun is setting and we turn to watch the spectacular scene of fishing boats off the coast, backlit by the golden orange sinking into the silver ocean. I've always wanted to come to Takalime, I say to Guillermo. Felipe and I talk about this mountain, since I ask him a lot of questions about what happens after death, according to traditional Yome worldviews. Guillermo watches the seascape quietly as the sky darkens. After a minute or two, he replies, here I have heard the sounds of the music, the little fiesta, the laughs and voices of our ancestors. Surum, I say? Yes, Surum. I know that this is an opportunity unequaled in UMA ethnographic research. A collaborator willing to admit first-hand experience of Surum. And how was that a counter? Guillermo points to the slope off the northern side of the mountain, about halfway up the base. We were coming back from fishing. We spent some time working and we came up through here and right around there, from there we heard the sounds. The tampoleo, the violins, the rattles. Faint, but actual. You mean actual, like you hear my voice right now, as real as I'm speaking? Well, not as close, but of course real. And, and did you stop by and visit with them, the Surum? Guillermo chuckles, no compai, we walked faster. We moved like chickens walking away from the cook's fire. He mimics the movement of men holding appliances under their arms, walking quickly like chickens. We both laugh, looking around at what is now, in just five to 10 minutes, a different environment. The sky is darker blue almost black far to the east. The contours of the land are less discernible with less ambient light. The green of the mesquite and cacti blend into a dense forest around us. I, I actually see if I can still see the path to the car. Yes, but barely. The Huyania is joining the Tukyania around our talking about the Yoania. I look back at Guillermo, this tall, strong man, and I tell him, I'm surprised you were afraid, compai. He takes off his hat and says, yes, well, these things are serious. I know a man who has been inside there. We both look to where Guillermo noted, mentioned before. A neighborhood there in Potam, a good friend. I do not want to tell you his name because I want to ask him first, but I do think he will talk with you. I will talk with him first, and you will record him with your machine, and he will tell you perhaps what he saw. He told me. He went inside, and he passed hours with them, having a paco all night in there. He told me much. I don't know if he told me everything. He has gained some knowledge, compai. This is true. And he went in right in there. I listened attentively and then I responded slowly to emphasize my sincerity. I would very much like to meet him. Ask him if I can talk with him. Guillermo replies, of course I will talk with him. Next time you come back, we'll go see him. Guillermo takes some steps to the direction of the car and I feel like he's wrapping up our conversation. But I have to ask you, compai, before we leave here tonight, I thought Takalime was where, after death, people went who committed incest in their lives. Did your friend join these deceased people for a Paco? Did you and your friend hear music coming from those ones living in the mountains? Or 
are those people with the Surum who live in there? Guillermo looks back at me and without missing a beat replies, no, compai, it is different. In this one place are two. The Surum are under the earth, and their houses open up here and there in mountains like caves. You will see the openings. And Takalim is, is a place where people go after death. They stay there. They're bound there. You cannot go there. We feel sorry for those deceased. These are not the same places, but they are both here in Takalim. I suppose it's difficult to understand. No, I add, not when I think about it like you. We begin trying to find our way back to the car, although now the path is barely visible. We're both straining our eyes to use the faint reflection of light from the ground. Watch out for snakes, Guillermo calls. Oh, great. After walking in silence for a few minutes, we reach the car. We shake the loose dirt from the bottom of our shoes and we get inside. I put the car in neutral and let off the brake, allowing us to roll backward toward the paved road at the base of the mountain. Shifting into drive, we move forward and roll down our windows to fill the ocean air. We pass a new subdivision of houses being built on the base of Takalim. Big houses, I point out. Yes, Guillermo replies. Many Americans are moving to San Carlos. Yeah, the land is more affordable here than on the coasts in the United States. But I'm sure they don't know who already lives in Takalim. Guillermo just looks at the nice houses by the tall brick walls. I venture a little more. Compai, do you think it's dangerous for them to live there on that mountain? Guillermo seems not to have a sure answer, but he says a bit more thoughtfully, well, I'm not surprised. This is what happens. Thank you. So um, what I would like to do is um, just ask a few questions myself of David, and then I'll, s do you want me to moderate? So what I'll do is I'll ask a few, pose a few questions, and then David, if you wish to respond to him, you're welcome to, or we can just open it up and I can take a speaker's list and call on people um, to help manage that. Before I do that, though, um, it was going to be a surprise, but now, uh, now it's still a little bit of a surprise. You can now understand why, in fact, David, at this pretty much this moment in the last hour, has been awarded a book prize. Um, he's won the Chicago Folklore Prize, which is given by the University of Chicago and the American Folklore Society, and it's being presented right now at the American Folklore Society's annual meetings in Nashville and it's a book prize for recognition of this book, and I'd like to read for you from the citation that's being read in Nashville um, right now. This is not my language, um, but it's, it's an honor of the prize. If told that in a single volume of ethnography, an author examines cosmology, mythological narratives, ritual processions, funerary practices, dance, ethnohistory, indigenous mapping, deer hunting, the complications of literacy, and religious syncretism, one might be likely to anticipate some thinness of treatment or a survey of tenuously connected topics. Remarkably, in this year's recipient of the American Folklore Society Chicago Prize, We Will Dance Our Truth, Yaki History in UMA Performances, David Delgado Shorter treats all these things and more besides with rigor, fine detail, and thoroughgoing coherence. Drawing on long experience with the Yoemem or Yaqui people of Potam Pueblo in the border state of Sonora, Mexico, Shorter does much to correct and complicate an ethnographic record that has missed many of the subtleties of indigenous cultural continuity. To mention only one example, a particular highlight of this study, Shorter demonstrates how the iconic Yueme deer dances serve as enactments of indigenous worldview and indigenous control over the historical understanding of religious conversion. Though they have often been viewed as secular art or touristic entertainment, shorter colors in these performances with a much fuller palette of significance, not least of all as cultural resources for the maintenance of UMA identity. Carefully positioning his own interpretations in relation to previous ethnographic work and placing extensive ethnographic dialogues between each of the analytical chapters, shorter provides a satisfyingly diverse but cohesive picture of indigenous self-perception and cultural control. I'm almost done. Nor does he neglect his own relationship to the people who welcomed him into their world. In frequent, gracefully written descriptions of field experiences and passages of personal introspection, such as we just heard, David Delgado Shorter invests We Will Dance Our Truth with the sensitivity and heart one hopes for in ethnographic writing. So congratulations, David. <laughs> So they made my job easy. 
Um, so I'll just ask a few very um, basic and general questions in order to open it up to everyone. Um, the first is just I'd love to hear how you came to this project. What made you go to this particular Pueblo, do this project, um, both in terms of the place, um, people, but also then the topic. What led you to religion, performance, ritual, this particular, to work with elders in, per, in particular? What, what drew you there, and, um, and what can we learn from that? Secondly, um, I, I appreciated you're talking about the role, your role as analyst. Um, and I wanted to just open up a little, give you the opportunity to talk a bit about some of the scholarly arguments in the book, if you wish to. And in particular, a couple that the citation um, mentioned, which was the way you think about conversion and also about colonialism and conquest. Because in both of these contexts, as I read the book, um, David's making the argument that, um, that it's, it's absolutely important to understand contemporary women performance as a form of historical consciousness that helps us think through the ways in which women people have asserted control over the terms on which they've interacted with others over time. And so um, understanding conversion as a process of adoption whereby, um, as in adopting a child, um, certain things you know, are brought into an existing view of the world um, selectively and under uh, quite an extensive amount of control is his approach to conversion and, simple, and similarly conquest, looking not only at the successes of the fierce battles, um, but also more generally um, at the ways in which we think about um, conquest in this area where um, arguably there has been a significant amount of control over the terms on which women people have engaged with Spanish and subsequent um, rounds. So those struck me as major arguments um, of the book, and I'd love to invite you to talk about them a bit more and your investment in those positions. And in particular, what does this allow us to see about colonialism um, that we might not have? What are the risks of, for a broader theory of colonialism, um, as well as the benefits of that kind of account? How do we balance that with the kind of thing that Ned Blackhawk has been talking about a lot, which is the, um, the importance of the hard work of talking about violence and the risks of talking about indigenous control and resistance in the context of, um, you know, of the brutalities that one must keep in the room. Um, so how, so what do you see as, how do you see yourself speaking to um, and helping us see things about colonialism and also engaging those risks um, in the kind of um, account you're giving here? Um, and I was thinking there again of the role of analyst um, and um, sort of what you saw as your role as analyst in relationship to narratives of asserting significant control. Um, how do you understand, in the book, you're understanding those narratives very much as a, a way into understanding historical consciousness and history. Um, what also are those narratives doing as people talk to their own grandchildren and want them to aspire to practices <coughs> in the present and the future, um, as well as understand practices in the past? Um, what are the ideological forces of these kinds of narratives? So that's the kind of substantive, there's the how'd you get to this, and then there's the I'd love to hear you more on the substantive um, scholarly debates part. And then finally, um, two things that you may or may not wish to address. One is, um, I am actually interested in um, the writing culture debates, the debates about ethnography to which David referred in his introductory remarks. Indeed, the History of Consciousness program at Santa Cruz was the center of a lot of this, and Michelle also came out of that um, program, and we have, I don't know if anybody else in the room did as well, um, but we have a lot of people here at UCLA. And, um, and in fact, David, one of David's advisors, James Clifford, um, was author of some of the most important writings that really shifted a lot of anthropological thought about what ethnography was, could be, couldn't be. Um, these are important debates of the 80s and many of us went, or 90s, I'm sorry, and many of us went to graduate school, undergrad and then graduate school, reading these, thinking about these. Where are we now with those debates about whether in fact we can um, write ethnography in ways that recognize our authority, the, the claims to authority that come with writing? Um, where do the debates that sort of picked apart ethnographic authority leave us um, with politics as a project? We learn how to kind of 
we learned something about the politics of ethnography, but um, the challenge was to then craft a new politics of ethnography. Um, where are we with that project? Where do you want us to go? And then finally, and perhaps related to that, what's next? What are you working on now? And what can we look forward to in the future? So I will stop talking. Um, you, of course, need not answer all of those, because I, I don't mean to take over the time that's open for all of us. So I'll pose those, let you say what you wish. You need not worry about all of them. And then we'll hear what everybody else has to say. So it's easy to, it doesn't seem like it'll be easy. It's actually kind of easy to hit some of these because there's no way to do a depth in depth treatment of the first one anyway. So I could just say what I tell most of my students is that I, like many anthropologists, I think fell ass backwards into their field site. Like there's no way you could have predicted. And I'm not saying that there's fate in the world that we're all subject to necessarily, but we're all makers of our own future along with some things that we had nothing to do with and had no idea they can control. So if I ask Al Roberts how in the hell did he start working, it probably due to some other decisions that he made. He had no idea it was going to turn out where Jacinta is working. You know, there's people in the room who work with communities that that relationship was formed through a weird combination of events. For me, I was raised by a, a, a midwife, um, great grandmother who worked in the Mescalero Apache community. So I was with this woman who was constantly having me in Indian um, communities. And so that then translated to being in New Mexico. I went to a lot of Pueblos as an adolescent or a kid. And then um, when I went to college, I didn't have the best relationship with my parents. So I went home with my Navajo friend every summer. So I spent three or four summers. And then I got hooked into the Native American church community and went to NAC meetings for several years. All of this took place before I took a problems in Native religious studies class. So by the time I took the class, I was writing papers in which the professor was saying, you seem to have a take on this stuff that I'd like for you to continue. And so I was, in many ways, just someone was nice. Some, some professor gave me extra time, and it led to a change of future. Because I thought I was going to be a lawyer for the Vatican. That's why I went to college <laughs> before I stopped being a Catholic or liking lawyers. Um, like, I thought that that was my future. And then this is one of those weird things. I'm in, I'm in a Native American church meeting, and afterwards a guy says, um, aren't you reading or writing stuff about the, the, the book on the Yaki that, that Professor Ken Morrison's making you read? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, you know there's that Yaki guy, Felipe Molina, who wrote that book, Deer Songs? And I was like, yeah, of course. You know, you're 22. Everything. Oh, my God. Do you think I could ever meet him? And he's like, well, he actually needs a ride to a conference in two weeks <laughs> where Rigoberto Menchu is speaking. He wants to hear Rigoberto Menchu speak. Would you be willing to give him a ride? Oh, absolutely. I'll take off work and I'll drive him to this conference. So we get in the car, and I'm driving to this conference, and we just, we're friends to this day. We talk every week. I mean, we just bond. We just like, and it had nothing, be, I, I didn't even add, we just literally have these shared histories and experiences. Our very first stop at this truck stop, we're going in for a cup of coffee, you know, like the diner with the big pies and the, you know, like that sort of scene, which is in between Phoenix, or Tucson and Tecate, New Mexico. So I think it would have to be Globe or Blythe or something like that. We're there, and we're sitting and waiting for the waitress to make our coffees. And there's this um, sort of like um, young woman wearing a lot of, um, what's that, hemp, hemp fiber, hemp necklaces and stuff like that. And she's got dreads. And she's sitting and eating her lunch at the diner. And she's reading Carlos Castaneda. And he says to me, <laughs> what? He's like, I don't know. So we get out, we're sorry, he's like, did you see what she was reading? And I had known, I had known Felipe for three hours. And I said, no, what? And he's like, Carlos Castaneda. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> he's like, you don't know about Carlos Castaneda? And I was like, no. And he's like, I like you. <laughs> and he had sort of watched me enough for two years that after the second year, he invited me to go to his ancestral homeland and meet his relatives there. I kept going down there for a couple of years. They invited me into the ceremonial um, society of uh, the Compatrasco system, which is I became a godfather, which works a little different there. Um, there you have to have a three-year commitment to put this um, item of clothing on a child in front of the whole village. Um, so that affirmed that I had to go every year because I made that commitment to these family members. And then at one point, it became really clear. I mean, at some point, they just say, why do you keep coming? <laughs> At which point I spelled out, listen, I'm really interested in these um, geographic areas that open up to cosmic dimensions. You know, you've got these caves that open up and you can walk inside them and they become the mouth of the snake. And I'm interested in how this stuff happens. And they're like, oh, if you want that, 
the elder guys will love you because they'll be able to go on road trips with you and take you to all these places. So it just turned into deep hanging out. The thing that I think is really interesting about this is that I was raised um, not knowing what I was. My mom was, this is a horrible term in our society, but it's the term we have, illegitimate. Um, and so we never knew who my mom's father was, since that's why in some ways I was sent to live with my great-grandmother. We knew I was part Mexican. We knew my dad is part German. And there were a lot of suspicions that my grandma slept with an Indian guy, which is why she didn't want to say anything because of the racism that's in southern New Mexico. So there was this thing in which when I was in graduate school, it was also when identity politics, maybe they are still horrible for graduate students, but when I was a graduate student, and perhaps I think when you were too, not being an Indian and doing Indian stuff was difficult. It was a challenge, and you better be fortified to have those conversations. And it became less about who you claimed than someone claiming you. It was, like less, it was less about, like for me, I didn't matter if I had a claim. It didn't matter if I could say, oh, listen, I kind of don't know. I'm, I think I'm Chicano. You know? when in, the response was, when I would go home, my grandma was like, you are not Chicano. You are Spanish. So there's even like internal racism within the family when you think you're sort of doing the right thing. Well, I thought this would play out really well working with Indians. But I work in Mexico, in which being Mexican and Spanish is, no, it's actually the word. Like, I've now moved over to the, they were actually better with me being a German American than like, oh, yeah, don't say you're Mexican. Because they're facing another colonial context. So there is this type of analyst position that happens where kids are now my godchildren. And the anthropologists, there's a lot of metaphors for anthropologists or ethnographers. They're, they're like sorcerers, or they're like map makers, or you know, they're, like, um, they're like ambassadors. I think we're also a bit like analysts when we think about the trauma of colonization, because we are willing to keep showing up and engaging the difficult conversations about what's the right way to talk about you, because it forces you, the person who I'm interlocuting, the person who I'm bringing into this conversation, to actually work through some of the ways in which we represent them. So the benefit of the writing culture debate is that it led a lot more people to say, what do you think about what I'm doing? That itself is valuable data. And even though as we started contesting what counts as data, narrative starts working. And where, where I think we're at now is that this, you know, technology messes everything up in terms of human trajectory, in terms of what we think is going to be possible. The writing culture debates happen, and they had an effect on a cadre or generation of graduate students. And now we're looking at what is possibly the ending of the book in what we know it. Scholarly publications, academic publishing houses are struggling in a way they've never been before. And so for a graduate student to think, I'm going to write a monograph about a tribe and it's going to get a readership, I mean, they told me, we'll publish, we'll publish a couple thousand. It will sell, your book will sell about two or 300, to be honest with you, because it's about a tribe in Mexico and it's anthropology, you know, gone. And so they just don't expect a huge readership. And the way in which the press is used to work is they used to be able to take that overhead. They used to be able to expect that book would be requested inside college courses. Now you can't have that expectation because of all the technological possibilities that exist with Open, our friend's project, who we work with, Jason Jackson, his you know, Open Folklore project is all about getting sure that we, we have these conversations about rights. And uh, he's one of the only people who are paying attention, I think, to the academic publishing houses and what will happen to them. So where we're at now, post-writing culture debates, is that I think not only has the form changed, and this is why I wanted to create a website, um, but also the audience has changed. And so like it was written in 1989, Native people are no longer being written about. They're writing, they're writing and they're reading what's being written about them. I took, that, I, I took that to mean in a real sense that as the technology changes, so is going to be their access, so will their access. And so by creating a website, I can use that website as an archive in a way that to this day, I mean, it happened as recently as last June when I gave them copies. They can be appreciative. They can understand that this is an important thing for me. And then it goes where no one will touch it and kids won't play with it. And they'll pick it up once in a while to look at pictures and say, look, there's a book with our dad in it. They don't know anything about what's going in there. They don't read Spanish. They don't read UMA. They don't read English. Reading is not happening. But when I show them my website and it's graphic, and it's ambient, and there's sound, and the text moves. You can press a button and hear the performances that they performed. It also starts engaging them a little bit more. And so with one image of the map being drawn that contests ancestral territory with what the Mexican government gave them in 1939, they get from page one that I'm, on their I'm pointing out their political argument. 
in a way that they won't do here. It, won't, it will never come to the surface for them. Also, the website works as an archive so that I can bring images of the, some of these pictures that you're seeing here are from the Museo de los Yaquis, which is a museum that's far away from the Pueblo, so they don't actually get to see the contents of their museum that's supposedly in their name to show Mexicans the UMA culture. So by putting these images inside a website, which there's no way an academic press is going to give me more than eight black and white, I mean, that's a fight. You have to have, this is not an art book, it's not for art history, so you get eight black and whites. So I think that where we're at now, to sort of jump to your third thing, is, is that we're at a different form exist, a different possibility exist. And, um, and so now, I think for many of us, you have all these, for any, many of us who are ethnographers, you have these years of images behind you and years of video behind you that are uh, accumulating. I think now more than ever, there's a possibility to make a DVD, edit it into a way that, can be, that the community can enjoy. Um, also, I think where we're at now is that, that give back process is just assumed like you can't even get in the door unless you have it. I think it's amazing where you think about 15 years ago, that was, not, that was a novel idea. Now, I know you wouldn't have gotten your work where you're at unless you had a reciprocal relationship with them in which you're giving them something. They're, they're gaining from your relationship with them, and we can be explicit about that. Um, the next project is, like you say, a UMA English dictionary that'll be a Wiktionary. So it's built on wiki plat platform, and so people can upload their own words or dialogue about the conversation. Um, the NSF and NEH have a combined um, Documenting Endangered Language, DEL, grant. And they, didn't, they stopped giving money to dictionaries because they found that dictionaries um, were often not being used uh, like we thought they would be. Quite frankly, black text on white page is boring to kids. And so we had to think of a way, so I got a grant last year from USC and NEH to develop this platform with some web designers. So what we took is we took the only published UMA English dictionary and I got the rights to it. And now I've been working with linguists to update it. And then we've been putting it on a platform so that um, when it goes live, which will probably be in a month, if when it goes live, Literally, kids in the Pueblo who have cell phones, more likely than actually computers, will be able to go to the internet and look at the Wiktionary and look at words in UMA and then add and contest definitions and treat, treat what is a, we think of as sort of as a stale object into a more engaging, um, growing, evolving language context. So we're not saying that this is the best spelling. If you have another spelling or if you learn it differently, Add it. Add it right there. It can, go, it can go under there. Additionally, you can create avatars, not, I know that's a weird word now for native stuff, <laughs> but you can essentially create an ID and you get points for contributing and you are going to next year be able to upload sentences to do pronunciation. And so the idea is, is that if you go in and you download or you play a pronunciation, you get a, a badge or a merit for that. So it ends up start playing upon more pre-adolescent interests, even though that to all of us we can go, well, who would want that? Actually, we know for a fact that accumulating honor and merit is really important. The Cub Scouts weren't wrong about that. You know, like that, that does keep you interested. So the dictionary is going to be done in two months. Um, next week we go live with an online, I curated the, um, the holdings of the um, NYU's Hemispheric Institute of anything having to do with the indigenous um, rights, politics, performance and intellectualism in Latin America and across the Western Hemisphere. Um, we finished that work in August. And um, anyone who's affiliated with UCLA will be able to get an access, a password. All you have to do is go to Hemispheric Institute. Um, NYU has a place called Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics. If you are writing and you go and create a login with your UCLA ID, because UCLA is a member of the institution, of the Hemispheric Institute, it will recognize you're at UCLA.edu and it will give you access to that curation that I just did. And it's called the Indigenous Americas. Um, so then the, the press has offered me an advanced contract to do a book of only the italicized areas. So you know how, like I said, that there's this academic language that I didn't read to you today? That wasn't an Indian thing. That was a yawn. Um, <laughs> it was, it's like one of those things where they would like to see a book of just the italicized things. So they've essentially asked me, do you have more field notes? Well, I have 18 years of field notes. Um, I'm not sure that that's what I want my next thing to be. So I've asked them to put that on hold. 
while I finished a book on Dead Man, the movie, for my own book series. So in it, I'm making the argument that Dead Man, which is, does everyone know Dead Man, directed by Jim Jarmusch? Um, so the thesis of the book is that's the quintessential native film. And so I break down what makes a native film and does being a native director have to be one of the de facto definitions. And in fact, you have all these native directors who say Dead Man's their favorite film. So <laughs> it's, very, it's very interesting the, what, what he's doing in that film. And so um, if you're interested in film, by the way, I should just let you know, uh, Atanarjua is a book that's available now. It came out two months ago. Um, our next book is Smoke Signals. It comes out in um, four months. And then um, we have an author here on campus for the book series, um, uh, Mishana Goman. We'll be writing the one on the New World, the Lost World. Which one's the one with Colin? New World, the Terrence Mal Malick film. Yeah, the New World. Should be writing the one for the New World. So before we go, thank you to the library for doing this. The writing series is fantastic, and it took a lot of effort. So thank you for doing this. Thanks for filming.